I'm waiting to hear it. Give us a good gulp. <laughs> 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 Please don't do that. If you do that, I'm down. <laughs> I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm down. I'm throwing the. <laughs> All right, we're starting at 11 o'clock. 11 oh, o'clock. Grief. Midnight by the time we're we're done here. Sweet. Uh, it's past so. my bedtime. Yeah, we got early morning. So. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to the Campus Waterfowl Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Christians, and here we are yet again on the Collegiate Waterfowl Tour. This weekend, we're here in Lubbock, Texas, highlighting students from Texas Tech University. And if you're not familiar with Lubbock, there's a, there's a lot of things going on here. They, they got a lot of different opportunities here for hunting. Um, and one that kind of stands out from the rest, from the, especially the rest of the country, are the cranes. So, um, But we're going to talk about probably a little bit of that in, in the podcast but before we get to the podcast and uh hearing from these students we got to thank some sponsors for supporting the collegiate waterfall tour and collegiate hunters all around uh first sponsor is ken cartridge coming out this year with their new fast steel plus stack loads this uh year we've been shooting the two four stack loads and then this weekend we got um some of the bb2 loads bb uh and two shot loads so um, giving those giving those a try this weekend. Um, also, another sponsor, Benelli USA, uh, allowing us to try shooting some of their Super Black Eagle threes and then also their M twos this this hunting season. So thank you, uh, Ken Cartridge and Benelli for supporting uh, the Collegiate Waterfowl Tour and uh, all Collegiate Waterfowl hunters out there. So um, other than that, not really any housekeeping stuff with Campus Waterfowl. Merry Christmas to everyone. This is. Uh, Right before mm-hmm. Thanksgiving, not Thanksgiving. Uh, this this is this podcast is rolling out right before Christmas, so Merry Christmas, everyone. Uh, we'll see you next podcast. Will be in, in a couple weeks after this. So um, until then, but we're, we're going to be talking about I think some some Christmas waterfall hunter Christmas gifts ideas. So maybe okay. are we going to do price ranges, you guys? Are we gonna do price mm-hmm. ranges or just like top five, top, ten? top five, wide open. All right. Super Black Eagle 3 is going to be at the yeah, top yeah. of the list for everybody, right? <laughs> deep, deep pockets. You can always use a new gun. That's right. <laughs> got to make it interesting. So, uh, But let's get to know who we got here sitting here. And if you guys are watching the podcast, we're actually sitting in the Fowler Hide Supply. What would you call this? HQ. HQ. All HQ. right. So very awesome space. A lot of a lot of neon signs, banners, flags. A uh, bear on the wall. It's a bear on the wall. So a lot. it's a cool, very cool space. And you'll be able to see that in one of our YouTube videos uh, from this weekend. But uh, let's start with Nathan here. I guess what's going on, guys? My name is Nathan Mossick. I'm a president of the tech chapter of Ducks Unlimited. Um, I'm a wildlife biology major, hoping to finish up this year, depending on how registration goes. Um, but, uh, yeah, I guess Thank we'll you. pass it on. I'm uh, Ross Cronholm. I'm a member of Texas Tech Ducks Unlimited. Uh, just graduated here in May. Uh, got a degree in business management. And so... I'm uh, Nolan Davis. Um, I'm on my final semester of tech. Um, I'm going to try the major in uh, industrial technology and pursue an engineering degree. Um, waterfowl hunting has been a, been a big part of my life, so hopefully hopefully, hopefully, I can take that and uh, make impacts on others and, and spread that. Very nice. Do you guys just want to jump into the, the gifts right away? I'm kind of excited for this. Let's just do it. Let's tis, tis the season. I right? almost feel like, like – we should do, do like a girlfriend list, though. Like, Ooh. what? What are you talking about? Hang on, where's this going? Yeah, like they, this? They, they, they send that to their girlfriend. They're like, here's like, you know, a couple things. Well, so so my girlfriend can get on here and watch this and and get some ideas. Yeah, how about so that? like tell her exactly what you want right now. Oh, I got a deep list. She's just gonna need deep pockets. <laughs> so I don't know. Should we do price ranges? I think or price ranges. Let's do uh, five thousand max. That's a gun and a couple decoys. Oh, you're you're doing like? Oh yeah, we can do a stack up. What what do you need to get started? You're, on you're the, doing the like, okay, you got a hundred dollars. What are you doing with that hundred dollars? Is that what you're doing, or are you gonna be like gifts under a hundred dollars? Ooh, that's gonna be hard. Is your girlfriend taking out a loan for this Christmas? She present might. In there? <laughs> She's <laughs> either gonna do that or take my credit card. Either way, it's all right. Most places do a farm now. You that, can, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Interest free payments now, or something. Mm. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, let's start out with. Let's start out wide open. Okay. What's one thing? Regardless of price range, what would you what would you what do you want? Well, if you want to start off big, let's go with a duck boat. Oh yeah, yeah that's you, a, that's duck boats. I mean, that's top of the list for that, you guys. Need go. a truck to haul it too. Okay. Let's go rigged out prodigy. You know, go rig it out, one and done. Maybe, maybe throw in a gun in, in there with them. So, 
is a whole. <laughs> yeah, let's do let's do the combo deal. Okay. Nathan, you got something that's at the top of your list of something you need? Probably like four dozen full body crane decoys because that costs just about as much as a boat. That's agreeable. <laughs> that's agreeable. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we got we're we're starting at the top. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh bring it down to say you got two. Now nah, let's go hundred bucks. Got hundred bucks. Hundred bucks. Hundred bucks. I think you could do a good mixed bag. You know. Yeah, I think a mixed. Throw bag a bunch too. of stuff in there. You get. Well, I mean, now we're messing with different price ranges, but you get hand warmers. You know, a good pair of gloves, a good hat. Mm-hmm. Uh, start to. <laughs> oh, so when it comes to hats, is there such thing as too many hats? No. 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 Absolutely. Heck no. Like with Christmas Day, say you got already ten hats in the, in the closet or something. No, you open up another hat. What's your reaction? There's, there's no. no she's yeah. going back on the shelf, and I'll wear it one day. No, I want to. I, I want to know what. What's your reaction? You open. You open a present. Oh, I'm stoked. I'm putting yeah, it on right yeah. there. Like, yeah. 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 it's going to Christmas dinner. Like, it. oh yeah. There's not. There's not too many hats. Light hats, heavy hats. What can? Is there a preference there? Ooh, you're in Texas, so like, I feel like light hats. It's got to be a snapback rope. <laughs> snapback rope hat, and that's that's it. I so you're you you're just like strictly talking about like yeah, just. Like, snap back and like ball yep, caps yep, type deal. Yep, yep, yep. So not what about like um, Stormy Chrome or what? Oh, <laughs> what about like stocking hats or something? Yeah. What about those? Yeah. Could you use another one of those? Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. I got a stack of them. Uh, I can. There's, you know. I seem to lose one on every hunt. So <laughs> it's it, it, be. Right. Uh, what else you guys can th- can you think of? Let's go with duck call. I mean, pick a duck call. Yeah. For okay. for a hundred bucks, one. there's might have to do, search a little bit, but do you trust your significant or like? Yeah, your girlfriend picking out <laughs> a duck call no. for you. Honest, honestly, absolutely not. not. No, no, right? <laughs> well, that's but, like the same thing with the boat. Like, but are you going to trust her to pick out the boat that you want? Well, I'm going to send her a picture, and if it's not exactly what it's like, it's going back to the dealer. It's going to so. be a pink zebra. <laughs> you want that receipt. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is that a true gift then? Well, I don't know if I'm going to get it or not, so it, it would be a surprise, <laughs> right? I'm not. Yeah. Okay. Do we need to have the conversation about sending a list to somebody? I don't. I think it's wrong. I don't like it. I think it ruins it. Well, what about when you write a, you know, a Christmas list to Santa? Well, that's different than Santa. Well, but I feel like like duck hunting, like most people are pretty particular. Like, that's that's this, the issue. This is true. So, yeah. do the people even bother then getting gifts for duck hunters be, in for duck hunting because it is so particular? So so so, if your significant other, if she can be in duck hunting too, right? So if, it it depends who who's giving and who's receiving, right? Okay. Yeah. So if she if she's in it just as hard as you are, then then there's that chance or opportunity to to get something that's worth your while and something that that you would be willing to use and and take out in the field and and use it firsthand, right? So mm-hmm. yeah, I think a lot of it is like he could you could buy him a duck call that would maybe be better than the duck call that your girlfriend picked out. This is true. But at the same time. You know, your girlfriend picks you out a call, and she thinks in the, in her mind, she's like, this is the one. I know he's going to like it. Does that mean more than the one that you're going to use more? It's got and the five it, stars on Amazon. Like, <laughs> oh, well. Great reviews. Com- com- great com- reviews. Coming from the loved one, I'd probably have to side with her. That's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. It, it might not be the one that's always hanging off of my lanyard, but <laughs> when when she's around, it, it will be hanging. When it's hanging, you look down. That's give right. give you that warm, fuzzy feeling. What about, like, easy – so, like, when it comes to duck calls and stuff, it's, like, yeah, very preference. Right. Um, and every everything's different. What are things in that are, like, safe gifts for Finishers. duck hunters? The what? Finishers. A finisher? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what what other things? I, I like – yeah, this, these are the gifts that are safe bets for the family and the significant right. others to buy. I, I can go back to, like, clothing, right? Like, you know, yeah. whether it's – or or, or uh, I mean Sitka or Bandit, what, whatever it might be, right? That's that's something that's pretty safe to say. Whether it's gloves or a beanie or a or a sweatshirt, right? That's mm-hmm. that's something pretty universal you would wear out in the field. Mm-hmm. I think those uh, who might, like those heated jackets that run off of batteries. Oh yeah, I think that's probably pretty safe because you can you don't have to be hunting to use that. Mm-hmm. Trigger gloves are probably a good one too. Yeah, that would. Yeah, I would be I'd be glad to get those. <laughs> <laughs> what about ammo? What what if like the person were able to just like find where you have your ammo, take a picture. 
That's great. That, yeah, that would be – that'd save me a ton of money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you always use, you could always use more ammo. Oh, yeah. It's oh, another yeah. one of those preference things where you got to make sure you get the right stuff. Yeah, but, but it's like you always have the good the, – the stuff that you like always right. on hand, I feel like. So it's like if they go oh, and yeah. they find that, take, just take a picture. You can go to the store, show the sales rep. I need this stuff. I need yeah. this. Yeah. What about lanyards? Are, so we're here at Fowler making lanyards. Lanyards is an interesting one because – like it, a lanyard can be just a lanyard, but there's yeah. also different things you can do. Yeah, so like uh, we do leather lanyards here, and uh, like I mean we have. Wow, what do we? You have? need a prop. I'm not gonna take this off. To go all the way over. <laughs> get it. Uh, we probably. I guess we have four different leather colors, and I mean we have. I think I think Cameron said earlier it was like 640 some different. Yeah, I mean it is a, it is a. A huge number when of it comes combinations. To the leather, the stitching, the drops, the drops. Was it those three? Yeah, kind of the customization the ones. options. And then uh, like sh- we have uh, like shorter lanyards. We have lanyards that don't get stitched all the way around. I mean, mm-hmm. it's anything. And I mean that could come down to preference again, but it's a pretty fair bet. Like if you get something like that, you're gonna appreciate it. Um, it's going to last forever. It's something that you're going to buy, and, like, they'll they'll have it for a while. It's not just one of those, like, kind of, oh, I'm going to wear it for a season or use it for a year and kind of forget about it, and maybe it goes back on the shelf That's, or whatever. It's got a story behind it, right? I mean, it exactly. goes, goes right. out on every hunt with you. And, and it's, and it's like, it very, they're, like, very subtle customizations where it's, like, you're not going to be mad if it's, like, the wrong color or something. Right. right. Like, you know what? They put their, their heart and their time into that. It's, like. That's what it's about. One, one of a kind, and right? Like, and one of a kind that carries a, carries a story behind it. But yeah, with calls, it's like you got sound profiles, which is very, very different. Right. Um, anything else you guys can think of? I'm trying to think too. We can always go with waiters, as long as she knows your size. Size of waiters. Blind snacks. Ooh, that's that a is it. That's a beef jerky. Like, get a good package together. Mm-hmm. Maybe put it in a bag. Get you. Yeah, get you a blind. Get bag. you a blind bag and stuff it full of stuff. Mm-hmm. That, that'd be a pretty safe one. That's a good stocking stuffer there. Yeah. 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 Like 10 or 15 pounds of beef jerky. You know, <laughs> nothing. Damn, much, that's, a that's, a, that's a big stock. That's a big stock. Three or four three or four cases of, you know, strawberry pop tarts and Twinkie. We'd be. A couple we'd be, honey buns. Yeah. We'd be rolling. <laughs> yeah. A couple monsters. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sounds stupid, but honestly, probably carabiners. I don't think a duck hunter could have enough carabiners. Yeah, this is true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We all know you're going to lose one. Oh, I lose one at least. <laughs> every two or three hunts even texas rigs right along with carabiners you can always go with with decoy rigs oh yeah there we go i'm just trying to think stuff i lose all the time <laughs> <laughs> i think we got a pretty good list going yeah, i feel like that's yeah. a pretty solid one mm-hmm. got got different price range options oh yeah from from seven thousand dollars probably what Oh, well, you prodigy. Let's let's say a, let's say a <laughs> solid <laughs> prodigy. Twenty thousand dollars. Got a boat. Prodigy's four. So let's say thirty-five grand. Down. So we're from thirty-five grand to fifteen dollars. Yep. There you go. Um, that's a pretty safe. It's covered, man. Yeah, so, like, something in there's <laughs> bound to get bought, right? There was. I watched one TikTok one time. I, I don't know if it was to, to about waterfowl hunting specifically, but it was like pertaining to like just hunting gear in general, but. It, the guy was going around like a retail store just threw his stuff and like showing his girlfriend or just significant other at the time like guess how much one of these costs and they would guess a price and it would just be like super low and he'd say the price and she just like the jaw oh, would just drop yeah. <laughs> yeah that was it's not a cheap sport to, or cheap hobby that's <laughs> absolutely <a fact>. not <laughs> but don't get into duck hunting and golf no yeah, yeah. yeah. that's a mistake and then duck hunting, golf, and girlfriends is the end of the world. <laughs> hey, but it's all right. We're going to make it work. Oh, yeah. right? We're going to make it work. <laughs> we may be eating rice and beans, but, you know, it'll be a good time. It's all for the ducks, baby. Exactly, exactly. Rice, beans, and duck, duck breast. That's yeah. right. <laughs> all right. Well, I think you guys – I think that's a good start to this podcast. We got uh, some good Christmas ideas there. Um, what else – where do we want to take this? You guys want to talk about some Texas hunting? Let's do it. I think it's a one of a kind, to be honest with you. From Texas east, is a big state. From east coast to this to or the east part <laughs> of the state to the, the south coast to the west panhandle, right? It's you got it covered. Yeah, you got a little bit of everything. We were talking about that earlier today, just how long like you know, my drive in here was an hour and a half. If I you know, I'm from Illinois. If I drive an hour and a half in Illinois, I'm not in Illinois anymore. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. and that's just a wild to get, to wrap your head around. That's a, so that's a lot of country well, to cover and a lot of animals to. Well, here you drive an hour and a half, you're still in the same cornfield. So, right. You know, <laughs> exactly. You haven't left the county yet. <laughs> Have you guys had an uh, opportunity to kind of hunt different parts of Texas, really? A little yeah. bit. Not not as much as, as I would like, but, yeah. you know, that's that's definitely on the on the mm-hmm. forecast to mm-hmm. get around. And Have you been able to meet people at, like, at Texas Tech's, that DU chapter there, um, just hearing stories from other people that have maybe come uh, from those areas? Uh, we actually have, I mean, this is kind of, like, off a little bit, but, like, a lot of New Mexico people. Like, come over here, and they'll tell us kind of hunting around there. We got a lot of people from, like, Galveston and Corpus Christi. Um, and, you know, they're big in this, I guess, diving ducks down there, redheads and, uh, you know, stuff like that. So it's pretty interesting to hear, you know, what they got going on down there compared, you know, they're taking boats hour and a half, and we're walking an hour and a half into a field or something. I mean, really, Texas is, is a little bit of everything, I feel like. Um, you know, you go East Texas, you got temper. You go West Texas, you're – hunting a pond or a dry field you go south you're hunting marshes it's it's a little bit of everything so mm-hmm. and when it comes to well diversity of birds you guys kind of have a lot a lot going on there too oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> go to all four corners of the state and kill the kill different species in all four corners mm-hmm. for sure mm-hmm. um you guys want to talk about what kind of lubbock as a whole what what uh, lubbock has to offer i mean everybody knows it for the crane i mean that's the that's the main draw um Doves, D- dove, Big on dove. yeah. Which really? honestly, yeah. Oh, like it is, like my, you have never seen. Hmm. It's Argentina. Like I mean, you you could come out here and limit out, and I'm not exaggerating. Twenty minutes. If you can shoot, you if can you limit can out shoot. twenty minutes. Yeah. Well, I was, we were seeing the doves tonight on our evening. Oh, yeah. oh that that's <laughs> just, not. Yeah, that was yeah. Those are just singles. They come in thirties, forties. You get 50s, on a maze just, field, and it's it's game over you know they're thick when you got when you got dove coming in and cupping up with teal on a decoy so it's, <laughs> you, you know it's a problem um i mean the the ducks are pretty good uh but it, it's mostly the big migratory birds so you, your geese and your crane uh, i feel like that's the big draw um how would you describe like the landscape out here flat 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 as far as you can see it. Mm. look at a two by four and that's about it's about what you not from uh, not a two by four from Home Depot, but like a two by four from like a quality place. And look, it's, look, like a piece of like a piece of plywood. If you could throw yeah, some I mean, dirt on plywood and and put you know weed or corn in there or, or cotton, that that's West Texas. A that's, lot of little that's fans. That's for you. Your, your West Texas. <laughs> great, great visual, visual, visualization there. Yeah, Nathan and, Nathan's dog ran about fifty miles away this morning. We still saw his tail wagging. Yeah. <laughs> and so. Yeah, and somehow there's still a giant mule deer walking around out here. So yeah, mm-hmm. that's a, that was another thing I did not uh, know any of that. That and then you're saying the the pig hunting out here. That, oh, oh, that's the one thing I never thought was like. I mean, we had it bad back bad back home. I'm from uh, Central Texas, so. I mean, they're a huge issue down there, but like up here, I figured there's not enough cover for them to really like thrive. But I guess they've kind of adapted. Mm-hmm. For the government to allow you to shoot them out of a helicopter <laughs> must mean they're quite the problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The only problem with that is we need to lower the lower the price on that. That's, yeah, that gets a little out of can budget. We, can we subsidize pretty, the helicopter ride? Yeah. Like. Thank you. <laughs> so when it comes to like hunting this area, as uh, college students what's that like it's tough a lot, a lot of yeah. people out here too right it's not you're not the only one right there's right. which granted Lub- lubbock's a big big town big city i guess you could call it or, or, or town and mm-hmm. you know it's, granted public land and private land there you're you're not you're never going to be the only one out in the field hunting right you, you can have one other person in the field next to you or you could have you know 50 people in the field next to you so then which granted that's that helps in a way, right? Because you know, if you got more people hunting, yeah, the birds are going to stay stirred up and and push over, and not not necessarily settle down all the time. So, I mean, that that can help and and not help, right? So it's you're not you're not alone hunting out here. That's that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We were uh, this morning. We were with Caprock, and you know, he's been out here five six years, oh, and yeah. in that time, it's just just guides alone is blown up. There's mm-hmm. more and more guide services out here, and there's more and more people hunting. So. Like you were saying, like when you came down here for the first time, I mean, yeah. y- it was about five people that were really, I mean, uh, probably more like real small ones, but like five main 
uh, outfitters, and now it seems that every person that moves up here is is running hunts. And I I think that might degrade the quality at some point with inexperienced people coming up here. But um, well, it gives you it makes it harder on private land. It's hard. You can't just knock on a farmer's door and ask oh. for permission because he's already getting if a you, check. Cut. Yeah, if you don't have a a stack of cash it's it's a tough one and that that's not even out here right that's that's statewide that's that's nationwide that's yeah, yeah that's i mean it's, that's anywhere you go mm-hmm. <clears throat> so what opportunities then does that give college students and just because it's very hard for a student to get access like what what kind of things do you do to maybe try to get on hunts or the number one thing that i did was join texas tech ducks unlimited and on, like I'm saying it, but honestly, that was like I didn't have hardly anything out here. I joined Ducks Unlimited, and now I'm getting on hunts, and I'm like it just opens a lot of doors and lets you connect with people who in the same interest group, who all can pull together their resources and get on stuff. And well, it's experience, it, right? And linking up with people and making connections, and mm-hmm. you know, you know somebody, they know somebody, and you know, and before you know it, you you got a handful of people that can cover, you know several thousand acres or 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 whatever the whatever the case may be even just putting a group together right i mean it's that's what's great about the sport right and ducks unlimited right you're with you're with a group of people that you you all share the same the the same passion for waterfowl hunting or hunting in general for that matter and Mm -hmm. and just that alone you know that's a different connection between you you and another person right that's that's a base foundation you can build off of and and even turning it i mean I've had it turn into lifelong best friends, so right. it's. I didn't. I didn't even ask. You, like, how did you guys meet? So me and him are from the same town. Same, yeah, same, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then Ducks Unlimited. Yep, Ducks You're Unlimited. Yep. I think. Uh, I think Ducks Unlimited offers like a really like unique opportunity because you know we get a good amount of people in. A lot of Lubbock people, so they know people like they'll know farmers, their family farms. Um, or like the outfitters, like I mean, the reason we went hunting with Jonathan today was through, you know, Ducks Unlimited. We've we've gotten a connection with him and a lot of the other outfitters. Whether that if that's like you know sending kids to work for him or, you know, really anything like that. I mean, any connection you can make is is a good one, and um, you can really kind of blossom with even the small ones. Like the like following off of that, like the good thing about that is. Like, you know, there's there's a lot of people that come from, the, you know, a waterfowling family or, or a hunting family for that matter that, you know, whether they join Ducks Unlimited or they don't, right, they're, they're just in the waterfowling community. And then, like, Ducks Unlimited, right, you can you can also get that group of people or, or individuals that come in and, you know, they weren't always born and raised around, you know, fishing and hunting in the outdoors. And they, to me, that gives them a, a big opportunity and, and a big chance to – to meet to meet people and and grow on that right so it, it gives them an equal opportunity and instead of kind of singling them out and put i don't want to say pushing them out but giving them a lesser chance of succeeding i guess mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. ross you raised your hand you no i was just that's me like i didn't you know i grew up around the outdoors but not mm-hmm. in hunting or anything and i always had an interest in it but never had a door to open and you know i get here and join i see a window sticker and i go oh tech's got an unlimited chapter and <laughs> join up and next thing you know i'm making all these friends and crazy how that works and it, it is, is. It it's, is. So it's, crazy. Really. it's a crazy world what was that um and i've and i've heard heard stories like that before where yeah no one's just like they've always maybe been curious about or it's like they take a class that's they, yeah. it's maybe involves waterfowl mm-hmm. or f- of some kind, and then they see the DU head uh, stickers and things like that, and they just start asking questions. But uh, what was it like when you did take that step to go to one of the like, was was it going to a meeting kind of the first step? Uh, yeah, I don't remember. I think you. I think you I, came to our banquet like the no, first. No, it was it was the meet. I don't know. I might have DM'd the Instagram page or something. But I, I had been a Ducks Unlimited member from back home just mm-hmm. through family. And I'd gone to a few banquets and stuff, but never really okay. involved or never really. So then I see the DU head on someone's truck or whatever the Here, deal was. Here, what you got on campus. Yes, sir. Uh, and I was like, oh, that. So I just looked into it. You know, I Googled it or whatever. And I guess the first link that came up was the Instagram. And so I DM'd the Instagram. And I guess it was the former president at the time. She said, oh, we got a meeting coming up. This, on Thursday, you want to come? So I came, and <laughs> our banquet was coming up, and the next, you know, then I was at the banquet. and Now you're living the dream. Now I'm living, living the dream. Living the dream. <laughs> Graduated. 
Graduated. Yeah, with a degree. With a degree. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> On time. Ahead of time. Ahead of schedule. Here we go. You made it. <laughs> All because of Texas Tech Ducks on Yeah. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit more about the crane hunting, uh, just because we are in Lubbock. Um, for anyone that's out out there that has only heard or watched maybe videos out there, what what's it like hunting cranes? Surreal. <laughs> Shooting pterodactyls. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's clouds of birds. It is big clouds of birds raining down on you. Right, like I'm talking about cranes like so I've, i mean i've lived in texas my whole life right now I've, I've never been been duck hunting been waterfowl hunting deer hunting all my life and i've never never been crane hunting so i've i've been goose hunting been duck hunting obviously and so cra- crane's gonna be a first so i know i've seen videos i know a ton of people that crane hunt and they they yell at me all the time to come up and, and shoot them and i just never carve out the time and this hopefully this weekend and we can get on some and and make and get another first so i do want to clear for context uh if anyone's listening that's not too familiar with like waterfowl hunting or anything like that, uh, we're talking about sandhill cranes. Sandhill yeah. cranes. Not, not whooping cranes. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, no whooping cranes. No, just just sandhill cranes. That's right. Uh, but um, yeah, no, cranes are they're different. It's, well, it's just different it, here. I mean, there, I grew up in Illinois. There's sandhill cranes in Illinois. Mm-hmm. You see two or three flying across. You go, oh, that's a crane. But you here, can't shoot them up there. That's the problem. Uh, here, they just pick up, and it's just a big cloud that moves across the sky. <laughs> and then you, you're you driving down the highway, and you see a, an entire field, and you think it's a big spread of decoys, but it's just crane. Mm-hmm. I mean. How do they just, like, decoy, or, like, how do, how do they work? Or what's the calling strategy or anything like that? So like, what's that like? I want to be honest. Like, it it's a it's a different thing. Like, it is a different animal from any other bird you'll ever hunt, you know. Um, they are probably the most uh, – they're picky, they're finicky, they're non-committal. Like, they'll be doing a tornado over you, and if one of them just whips off to go get a drink of water, they're all gone. Or, like, I mean, they'll hover above the decoys for minutes and minutes and minutes, like right above them, and they just won't, you know, they won't come down. Um, I don't – I'm – I'm really curious on like where that comes from, like because they're really eating the same stuff that gate geese are eating, um, same fields and everything. So I'm kind of wondering on like you know, like if it's like a predatory thing or you know, really what's going on there. Um, mm-hmm. But it it is a really different experience, and you know the hide super important, uh, and wind is also really important. They're they're big birds and they need a lot of wind to. Uh, land real easy and get up real easy so um that's a, that's another big thing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. no i remember when we came down here yeah about five years ago now like you do not look at the cranes when they're coming obviously you never want to look right at the birds or anything but it's like don't move like they will pick you out oh yeah us. the yeah. whole time they're like hovering over you. you can see their heads like just going back and forth back mm-hmm. and forth back and forth i mean it's it's wild how much they pay attention to the mm-hmm. to the spread the calling yeah the Calling's super unique and takes a special person to be able to blow yeah. those crane calls. Um, and even, gosh, what else are just some of those little things? Like, that, what about like even your decoy spread, right? I decoys. mean, that's, that's got to be a big thing. Even off the little knowledge I know about crane hunting and, you know, goose hunting kind of falls in that category. Is, you know, you got to make sure you pick the right side of the field, right? Cranes and, and those bigger birds are going to they're gonna pick a certain part of that field and, you know, you that which that's when that's when scouting comes in right and Nate I'm sure you can follow up on that I mean that's I know a lot of guys like they can go goose hunting and snow geese hunting and, and crane hunting they can set up on one corner of the field and the wind can be right well they may be using you know a high spot in, in the middle of the field or on, on the left fence line or whatever it might be and mm-hmm. you could have a thousand birds in that field and you might not get one you know decoy in on you even I mean like going back to them like finding the little things like it's cold morning frost on decoys gone if they see it uh like a little shine they're they're out of there i mean a a lot of guys run uh stuffers Mm -hmm. um kind of avoid that issue but once again you got to shoot a lot of crane so it it's tough i mean it's it really is an art i think and you really have to know what you're doing to to get successful um i think cranes are something where 
it's very hard for someone just to go out for the first time, even if you are an experienced like duck hunter or goose hunter. Um, going out with probably an outfitter is probably the best thing you yes. could probably do to learn because these guys, especially like, like there's they're educated all over the place. But like the 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 two times I've now been in Lubbock, it's like they know their stuff. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Greens. Um, yeah, it's incredible just listening to them. It's you could pick their brains all day, uh, just sitting there in the blind and asking them questions about cranes, and you can't get like. An hour in the blind with them is like worth probably about four years if you just try and oh, <laughs> to oh, yeah. trial Absolutely. and error it uh, back home or something if you can shoot cranes. So I heard a guy he was talking about a guide, and he said that that man has forgotten more things than you'll ever know. And that I thought about that for a while, and I went, "You're uh, probably right." Mm. But to think about all the the just the little things that being out there every day that they see and they learn, yeah. and they just you know it's nothing to them and. They're just spitting stuff out at you, and you're just trying to take it in. And yeah. that's a total. I mean, crane hunting on its own, right? That, that's a that's its own game. I mean, that's that's totally different than than trying to decoy. You know, a, a set of mallards coming in on you, right? That's that's a different animal out out in the field. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like to. I'm a dog guy, so I like to think about the retrieve. And we were talking today about uh, cranes and how they're different and how they're a little more dangerous for dogs and even just picking them up, you know, they've got those beaks and those talons kind of like a hawk. Um, so it can, they can do some, they can tear up a dog and, um, you know, some people run goggles on their dogs just to protect their eyes. And mm-hmm. it's, it's just another thing to think about. And yeah. yeah. And the reward. Oh, some hey, of the best eating you'll yeah, ever eat. Yeah. <laughs> say. Tasty. Yeah. It, yeah. We have, Oh, yeah, you, we got the chef yep. right here. Yeah, guys. yeah. So that's the that's the best Sand Hill Crane cook in the <laughs> at least in Lubbock County. So <laughs> oh, I don't know about that, but I mean, recipes coming up, right? What's yeah, no, it's so podcast will be out Tuesday, um, and then yesterday or today's video will be out Thursday, and then I think we're gonna do tomorrow's video. A little come was it December twenty sixth? I think the day after Christmas. We'll have a little Christmas video i think of hunting hopefully and then uh the crane crane recipe will be that third next thursday so 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 if somebody knew right they whether they went out crane hunt and got got some crane or or somebody gave them to them what and they ask you know what what's the what's the most generic way you would cook it right what what would be the short answer to that i mean a fillet a fillet right so it's 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 no fat but it's tender I mean, it it really is just like a a crazy piece of meat to be on a bird. It's like if a cow were to have a breast. Well, it's like <laughs> <laughs> that would be it. That that's a weird way to put it. I was gonna put it, you know, just can, a, can we get a quote on that? Yeah, like, just <laughs> just imagine a just this beautiful wagyu, or black, just say let's just say a straight black Angus cow. Imagine if it had wings, right? That's. Yeah. That's about as close as you could put it. it but see, the the black Angus cow would look a lot better than a crane because crane are probably the ugliest birds this you'll is, ever this seen is in, true. in your life. They're not pretty. At least you don't got to shoot a crane the size of a cow. So yeah, that yeah, would be that'd be a tough one. We'd be in trouble. That Kent would have a hard time with it. I think. <laughs> no, I think I think it's no. Th- those, well, fast, it. those fast steel pluses knock them. <laughs> Drop that cow. <laughs> <laughs> Folded him over. <laughs> The flying cow. <laughs> if you had flying cows, who said you had to have a duck stamp or a migratory stamp, right? Yeah. What, what's the? I mean, the yeah. things we're talking about. Eleven. Th- what's the limit now? on bovine? Hey, that's <laughs> that's the gray area in waterfowl, right? So <laughs> you're the cowboy, right? What, what's the? I'm definitely not the cowboy, but I don't think there is a limit on cows. You got to feed we, America somehow. There we go. Right yeah, there. Yep. Yeah, heard it. Got to make sure. Got to conserve. Got to make sure there's some for future generations. Shoot, what else? What else are you guys into? What else do you guys do? Out, let, let's talk about outside hunting. What do you guys do outside hunting? Hunt. Hunt. Yeah. <laughs> hunt, hunt <laughs> think about hunting. I mean, I mean, I I enjoy anything outdoors. So I mean, I'll All go outdoors. I'll go hike or kind of got out of the video games and and went outside and that's been my thing. I, I like to. <laughs> Saw hey, I mean, I, <laughs> uh, you saw the sun, and it was like, wow. It was a life-changing experience. <laughs> I went from vampire to D. Yeah, I mean, that was that was a good good thing. Um, 
and then I I just got a puppy, so I I've, I've enjoyed trying to train that. It's been the most taxing and challenging thing I've ever done. Um, couldn't imagine having a kid if it's anything like having a puppy. <laughs> but I mean, man, that's about that's all my time right I, there. You know, there's only one way to find out, right? So. <laughs> Dang man, <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's too much. Yeah, yeah, that's too yeah, much yeah it's too late for that. <laughs> uh, no, I heard having a puppy is harder than raising a human child. So, oh, then we're good. Yeah, I think I'll be all right. We're gonna be a okay. Yeah. Think about it. you can't. You, you know, you put you could just put a diaper on a baby. But if you put your baby in a crate, then it's. Well, yeah, you can't you can't <laughs> yell at your dog or your baby fetch and it's gonna waddle out there, you know, and go pick a duck up. Yeah, if it's a bad kid. <laughs> well, this is true. <laughs> I used to pick up rocks as a kid, so. <laughs> See? Jesus. You got to train your kids right. What are some things that you're doing now? So let's talk talk through that situation. How old How old is your puppy? And what kind? So he's a he's a poodle pointer, and it's a German poodle and a German pointer. He's a, I think seven months, and he, he like just turned seven months. So we've been doing a lot of obedient stuff. I I was doing a lot of retrieving stuff, and I started to see some some things that needed to get worked on obedience wise so i basically cut out the retriever training for the past two weeks and then be going straight obedience um i think i i misvalued that um i think you probably should definitely have an obedient dog before you even attempt to to really get into retriever training um but i mean we're doing sit stay heal he does great when like we're right out in the parking lot here, like actually working, but you get them in the field and there's distractions. That's when it starts Old going south. Yeah. yeah. Which I can't blame him. You know, he's, he's so young that, um, I really don't expect him to, you know, not get distracted and not, you know, cause some problems, but it is what it is. Mm-hmm. So yeah. you had to go through one semester with him so far, right? Yep. Through, through, like balancing college and a dog. What was that like? <laughs> If I was going to give anybody some advice, you need to, like, think on getting a dog for, like, <laughs> <laughs> for like six months before you do. Like, I mean, like, I know most college people, like, they'll see a dog on the side of the road, and next thing you know, they, get, they got an apartment dog or something. But I found, like, it is it is a lot balancing, like, work, school, and, and a dog. Don't what listen it, to a word he's saying. Dog is man's best friend. This is true. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. Go get the dog. But it also depends on, on what kind of dog, right? A, a bird dog requires a, a lot more attention, a lot more training, you know, because, I mean, they, they can't forget, right? If, if you train them, you can send them to training. You can train them yourself, right? If, if you don't work that dog, then it, it's going to lose its ability, right? It, you're going to have to start from square one. And so that's j- – just having a bird dog alone is, is it's, has its own work cut out for them. So – I mean, that's, yeah, fair point. I think, well, I, okay, so right. I've got a two-year-old lab, and I got her, oh, shoot, uh, <laughs> maybe my junior year, second semester junior year. So I had her for a year and a half, or three total semesters. Mm-hmm. And I think, I thought it through a lot, and I think timing just like college-wise and timing-wise, I think it was really good to have that dog a year and a half old by the time I'm getting out of school and going into a full-time job because I mean I know college is busy and you got a lot going on but there's a lot of time spent at home whether you're studying whether you're doing schoolwork, whether you're just hanging out mm-hmm. and so you get to share that time with the dog and make that connection and do whatever you want training wise and then by the time you know they're a year and a half they're a little more mature and you can if you have to go take that full-time job and whatever they can they can spend a little more time by themselves, and then you can, you know, continue to work them. But I really like my timing on getting my dog. Um, you know, I don't – she's two, and maybe she should be feel ready. I don't think she is. Um, she's getting steady under the gun, and she's getting there, but she's not there. But I think timing-wise, it's important. Um, maybe something to think about is timing during the year when you're getting this puppy. Um, if you're getting a puppy, if you're getting a – trained dog you know if you're getting puppy puppy you might you got to think about how busy you are and being able to get up in the middle of the night and take them out and Mm -hmm. so there's a lot to think about it but i you know like i said i'm a dog guy and i just there's nothing better i think that's another big thing is like after school like after you graduate 
Because, like, I mean, you're basically getting whatever job comes up first. So, like, I mean, you have to make sure that you take care of that dog and have a place for it. Mm-hmm. So, that, that's, yeah. So I, uh, I got her. I was, tw- had to be 20, I guess. Um, and I think, you know, labs are easily 12, 13 years. To think that I would be 32 when that dog's thinking about kicking the bucket, you know, I'm, I'm prob. I hope maybe I'll be married. I, I might have kids. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a whole like that's a whole new life that and that dog will have been with me through that. But to think about, you know, you do have to think about past that, you know, year and a half that you got left of school. Like, mm-hmm. oh, now I'm out of school. I, you, you still have the dog, and you know, it's not probably not i don't think it's right to just be able to get rid of it or mm-hmm. you know stuff happens in life but well, it's like like you said it's it's like raising a kid right it's it's sticking with you right it's it requires that attention and and you know teaching and, and oh, yeah. obedience so it's they're they're there to ride ride along with you and sometimes a good butt whooping <laughs> that's <laughs> that's right can you still say that yeah, i don't know in today's <laughs> world I, I did what about so Going back to what we were talk, first started talking, or what we first talked about, getting a puppy for Christmas. Oh, I'm gonna have to say no. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna say just, no. just, just strictly because of there, there's so much behind the scenes stuff that goes on when it comes to picking a bird dog that, right? There's, there's a lot of ways it can go right. But I think, and I think a, you've had this conversation though before you get a dog. Yeah, with this yeah. Person. You've probably been like. I you probably been looking at dogs, showing her dogs like yeah. yeah I mean that you'd have to have a previous conversation, right? It's yeah. not like hey Christmas morning, hey I got a bird dog wrapped up Surprise. in a box, <laughs> yeah. So I went down to the shelter and got you a bird dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's eight years old. Comes yeah. back with a little wiener dog. Yeah, yeah. He's I only think, got three legs. I think you pronounced it Chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mexican bird dog. So you think that? It, what do you think? What are your thoughts on it? You think it c- can be done? Situationally, I if, think if there's, it, yeah, there's if it a time was and a place. Previously discussed, yes, but it would have to. You know, if you've you've been to, oh, I this is the kennels I'm getting her from, mm-hmm. and I want you know definitely want a girl. I definitely want a boy. I definitely want you know. Right, if you so. know exactly what it is, and they've just been waiting to pull the trigger, and you're all comfortable with it, I yeah. think it's a great. I think it'd be something cool. Yeah, you talk about um, like the litter. It's like being. Picking the like having a certificate or whatever mm-hmm. on Christmas morning of like like saying that oh. you get a pick I didn't a even puppy think in about that. this That's a, upcoming spring yeah. from yeah. this litter. Yeah, that'd be good I'll be one. like, you are you you freaking serious? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think that'd <laughs> be a, good. Like not necessarily a puppy on Christmas Day, but yeah. like, hey, I'm getting you a dog in three months. Yeah, three months. yeah. Because right. like I think it's like something a person would always talk about. Yeah. It's like you yeah. yeah from you want it from this this pedigree or whatever. Um, and it's like maybe Christmas Day is a, a good day then. That's a good, good, good gift there. I didn't there. think about that, yeah. Then that gives you, you know, a couple months, few months to really think about it. And, mm-hmm. Yeah, you can – yeah. Mine was, mine was funny because she came from – or I, you know, I put my deposit down on that litter and I wanted a female and um, out of that litter of 10, there was only – you know, I was, I was second in line for a – silver female say what you will about silver labs um i was second in line for a silver female um and i guess the people in front of me had just did they win uh we threw a tortilla on the i field. just saw a tortilla sitting on the football yeah, have field. you seen that like <laughs> yeah. that whole thing yeah. what is that oh dude so like uh football games oh here we go uh for contacts everybody listening we're watching <laughs> the texas tech in california uh bowl game right now and there's a tortilla on the football or on the screen i on the football field, the tortilla. And I was like, well, <laughs> "There's a there's a reason behind this." Yeah. So, uh, uh, our God, was it was early. It's not like an old tradition. It's like 2000s, right? Yeah, it's fairly recent. Uh, I think uh, I think it was Baylor. They called us like a, just a bunch of tortilla making, you know, something. Something West Texas. Yeah. And so, uh, <laughs> like, I think when Baylor came, we everybody threw tortillas on the field, and it stuck. And I mean, it's. It's really a, a wild tradition, and I don't know how they still do it, but um, it's, it's gotten to be an art. Oh, it really is. Like, I mean, people are like getting Cause biting holes in here's the tortillas. The thing. Yeah. No, no, no. Here's the thing that no one thinks about: they don't allow you to bring tortillas into the stadium. Yeah, you got to get the tortilla. In <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. there is an entire underground tortilla smuggling. <laughs> Granted, we are not promoting bringing no, tortillas. No, we would never. It's against the rules. You should not do it. 
we are bringing just having this a conversation because I have no clue what this is. <laughs> so you know, you got they got people. You know, you know, you're checking for your normal safety items at the gate, but also. They got a Rubbermaid garbage bin full of tortillas <laughs> that they've found in people's waistbands and boots and hats and this. It pull it out. Come on, dump it. So, you so know. what are they doing, right? Because you know you can go to the store and buy a pack of Mission tortillas. Well, of course, everything's going to be marked up in a football game, right? So, oh, yeah. if everybody's throwing tortillas, how much money is getting thrown onto the football a field? Bunch. A lot. <laughs> a bunch. I mean, there, there's probably the stale ones. Twenty thousand oh, yeah. tortillas. Yeah. That oh. that make the field, and it, it, here's the thing: like for the opposing team, you're not just getting hit with a tortilla; you're getting hit with a tortilla that's been sitting in somebody's pants for over yeah. two hours, Sweated. sweating. sweating. It's, it's like four months. It's been sitting in the cabinet for a year and a half, and then they say, "Oh, we can bring these. We'll just bring these ones to the game because they're not good anymore. So, so they're stale. So a, and then they're a, sweated on. Oh yeah, you're, so you're getting a, a butt fajita, right? So <laughs> oh yeah, it, no, it's to been, the dome. Yeah, it's been basic. Yeah. Basic. I mean, it's 105 so it's, degrees. Oh, yeah. Like it's it's cooked, you know. You throw that, and it's whoa. college yeah. football. Whoa. <laughs> but but first, you take a bite so it flies faster, yep, yep. flies farther. What's yeah. another? Uh, I think that's the only thing we've really figured out that makes them go right. Makes them go. Yeah. Well, you know they're reusable. Yep. Yep. If a you, lot of times they don't make them on the field, so they'll start from the top. So as you go, like throughout the game, you know, kickoff, you'll get a big wave down, and then you'll just see them around, and you'll pick them up. And then are you serious? Like at the Texas no, Tech this games. happens. There's waves of tortillas flying oh, through yeah. the sky. Kickoffs, um, punts, <laughs> like big like touchdowns. Ooh, tortillas. Yeah, like any, it's a thing. <laughs> any, any big like game turning play, right? Any any, yeah. any big oh play. Anything exciting, it's like applause and tortillas. <laughs> so it's like it's NFL versions like right when people go crazy and they're throwing beer canes down, it's like, well, college you gotta throw throw tortillas. So well, it's like Sometimes you get, sometimes you get aluminum and plastic in the air, but well, you know we don't we definitely don't promote that. <laughs> no, at least tortillas can feed the wildlife around here. So yeah, exactly. It's it's conservation. Yeah, that's right. Conservation for the lack of grass that is out in West Texas, tortillas will probably could fulfill yeah, that. probably could use it. Learn something every day. I was going to try to show you a video, but I can't find it. UT game last year was probably the most tortillas I've ever seen thrown. So in many tortillas anywhere. I mean, I mean it was. It's, I, yeah, you have to experience it. I mean, it looked like they just flew the C-130 over <laughs> when they did the national anthem. And just it looks like the C-130 <laughs> dropped tortillas. Yeah. I hope everyone just stopped listening to this podcast yeah. and went to go look go to for YouTube. Yeah, please, please, video. Please, uh, it's, it's there. I think it's necessary. So, so when the next no. tech game comes on, just, just tune in and yeah, see what happens. You'd be surprised how often I have to show people that video because they don't believe me. I've never heard. Of, yeah, I've never knew. Like uh, Red Raider Outfitters, they sell all the merchandise for Texas Tech and whatever, and they have stickers that say, like, it's like the old got milk, but it's got tortillas. <laughs> people, be, people like, at away games will bring, like, tortilla blankets. Like, that's how you know. Uh-huh. Like, you look around, you see a bunch of tortilla blankets. Like, it's not red and black. It's a tortilla There's blanket. my people. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. I'll, I'll have to look into this more. <laughs> <laughs> that's a first, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That is something. <laughs> yeah. Oh man! All right, we oh. talk. what do you got? Sorry, my dog. She anyway. I was I was not supposed to get her. Is what I'm trying to say. And she was the people last minute dropped out. So there was only one female silver in the litter. Anyway, I was second. They dropped out. I so it was like fate, right? So you get that. You know, you can still have that moment if you, you're getting someone a puppy or a certificate or whatever for Christmas. You get to have that moment and then anyway i didn't you know just jump back on that thought but mm-hmm. i like the puppy for christmas idea what about like breeds of breeds of uh like duck hunting dogs it doesn't get better than a lab i was gonna say i might i'd have to go old school and, and go with the lab right that's that that's the original bird dog just uni- universal all-around bird dog right that's that's what i think that's what started it i mean mm-hmm. I may I may be wrong without doing deeper research, but yeah, especially duck specific. Um, being out here, I've got to be around more working dogs and just bird dogs in general, and you know the pointers and there's a hundred different. I don't know how many different pointers there are, but there's a whole bunch of different pointers, and they all have their own things. But ducks and retrieving is, I don't think the Labrador. You know, there's I'm sure there's dogs that can do it better on less food and less water and higher end whatever you want to say but just mm-hmm. for the nostalgia of it 
Labrador Retrievers. And you can't beat the picture, right? When a <laughs> no. when a iced over black lab or toggle lab, what, whatever lab got it the is, icicles iced down. over, and you got big yeah. green heads hanging out of it. That's <laughs> that's picture in, in the waterfowl industry, right? So, yeah. I think Ducks Unlimited, you know, carries that sentiment in all of their, you know, like a, at our Paintings banquets year, and stuff, man. all the paintings. It's <laughs> yeah. it's always lab. See a lot of labs. As, long, as long as you or those can, Chesapeake Bay Retrievers. As long as you can bring the painting out. Yeah, as long as you don't slam it against Ooh, my truck. This is a I mean, great story. He's, Listen, Ross was telling me this a little bit while we were cooking that. All that right, curry. so it's my, you know, I'm graduating. It's my last Ducks Unlimited event as a student member, and I'm a little competitive, and I hadn't yet to win a item at a live auction at one of our events, and I was determined. And so, you know, there's some things that were a little out of my price range, and there was a painting, and a, it was the, was it the painting of the year? It was the painting of the year. Yeah, yeah, no, it's. The artist of the year, the, the artist green of wing. the year. Green I think wing, it was like wing, a green wings over the bow. Yeah, and it's a, like that vertical one. It's a yes. vertical orientation. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was like and a bundle. It's like a of the year like bundle because I think it was the decoy of the year too. Wasn't it was it? a green wing decoy. Oh, you, you got a couple things. It, well, it was the painting and then a green wing decoy. Okay, but it was live auction. Yeah, live All auction. Right. I I All am right. a sucker for a live auction. And I'm, so I'm up there like I'm carrying stuff or I'm showing people. I'm you know I'm helping out with the event and also like. Hit me, you know, mm -hmm. right here. I'm bidding. Anyway, so I win it, and, you know. Was it between you and another person? Yeah, and I had, up. you know, it was one of our repeat uh, attend, like a, you know, a member that swung by a bunch. And so we, he and I had kind of a funny relationship, and I was trying to convince him to bid again, and he just, what, he was having too good a time to. So I ended up winning it, and, you know, that'll happen. So I'm on my way out for the night, and. We get everything cleaned up, and I'm carrying it out, and it's West Texas, and it's windy, and, you know, I've got three boxes, and I've got this big painting, and I'm walking out to my truck, and that wind picks up, and I go, whoa, because, you know, the wind catches the painting. The painting swings around and smokes the corner of Nathan's truck. I mean, I thought I did some serious damage. <laughs> it, was, it was a smack. Hey, what, what kind of sound did that make? I it wasn't whoa. It yeah. was like wham. I mean, it <laughs> was. I mean, like it just it just caught sail and bam. Anyway, so that happened, and in all of that commotion, the green wing teal decoy that was sitting on top of the box, which it should have been in, that was totally my bad. I was like, ah, I'm you know I'm just going to the truck, into the asphalt parking lot, million pieces, and I'm just I'm in a panic. And I just I think I put a dent in his truck. Um, the you know, the frame's all warped and bent and broke, and I got a, you know, a green wing teal head that just, I just <laughs> kicked off into oblivion, and... Did you at least pick the pieces up, or did oh, you just Oh, no, I was them? sitting in the parking lot for 15, trying to get the little bitty pieces, because I was like, there's a piece of his nose I know it's missing, and I just could not find it. It drove me crazy. I was looking for it, so I ended up getting it back, and I, you know, super glued it together to where, you know, it's sitting on a shelf right now, turned just the right way to where you can't. With the back half still not yeah. put together. Yeah, no, you can't see it. Yeah. There's like a hole in his nose <laughs> where I still couldn't find that piece. And it'd be, would Bill, sorry, whatever, um, whatever you want to call it. Uh, anyway, so, but you know, our regional rep was nice enough to <laughs> get me a replacement on that decoy and that made me feel better it is still in the box with the tape on it because i'm too scared to take it out <laughs> don't want that wind to come through the house yeah, and yeah, man, pull yeah it that, off the shelf. those ac units can they can <laughs> kick pretty good that's another thing about west texas that we hadn't really talked about in lubbock was the wind the wind yeah dust storms it sucks right have you oh, heard yeah. of a haboob <laughs> <laughs> so, a haboob a haboob huh? so it's it's a dust storm right it's a sandstorm from from hell <laughs> I, mean, I mean like it it's a wall of dirt mm -hmm. that just blows in and you can watch it come from you know we talk about it being flat you just watch it come in and it just comes in and then you're in it and you can't you know you can't see across the parking lot you can't see Jeez. and you're breathing it in and and this you isn't got like your, in your teeth this isn't like your dark dirt right i mean oh. when you look into the sky it's, it's just red. red wall of nothing but Is sand that a mission and dust impossible movie there's that, and then there's a was it American Sniper too, or like yeah, that oh, yeah. walls coming yeah. in. I mean, yeah, it, you see some of those in movies, yeah. like it's, that kind of stuff. It's, it's basically that. right off of Mars, right? I mean, it's wow. I, I mean, remember walking out my dorm freshman year, I like open the door, I'm like man, it's kind of windy. I like look up, it's the most intimidating. Like the sky gets dark, mile high 
wall of dust like halfway across the parking lot and i was like yep i'm not going to class hmm. even, even driving out and not even in lubbock in general like west texas there's there's times i've had to pull over going out west or coming back from the west coast or anything like that and you know i've you've had to pull over on the side of the road because you you can't see the front of your hood on your truck it's it's so dense and it sounds like bbs are hitting your truck when the wind's blowing there's been multiple times i've gotten text messages from love it like from tech from whatever that says like you know if you're driving pull over and turn your lights off because if people see like tail lights or whatever they'll try and find you or they'll like follow the vehicle in front of them which mm. is just you in the ditch with your oh, lights gotcha. on yep. um so you you know they get off the roads and because it's i mean it gets dark and quick can that happen like all year round oh yeah springtime really is when it, it, it kicks up yeah. really yeah. Your, your dry season right i mean obviously rain rain has a big factor that on down, that. Yeah. I think it has something to do with field cover, though, doesn't it? Like springtime, cotton's not really in there. That's so e- erosion, right? Yeah. Like there's nothing yeah. holding this because the, the dirt and the sand out here is right so so fine in some places, right? It's even even a 30 mile an hour gust can pick up dust and it just builds. It's builds, like being builds, on the beach builds. like 24 seven. Yeah, I think it has something to do with those windmills kicking it. I in. think yeah. <laughs> Same there thing with go. the rattlesnakes, man. That's what brought the rattlesnakes up here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Every Bird farmer blinders. up here ever. That's why we need to go to the solar. Solar yeah, power. yeah, just built solar farm. That's cooked, right. You you cook the birds before they hit the ground. Golden. Hey, you ain't got to waste a bullet, do you? Yeah, no. shell. <laughs> it's medium rare. Yeah, right out of the sky. Good grief. All right. Well, I think we're we're cutting it right underneath an hour right now. But I got. You guys good? You guys yeah, want to talk talk about anything else? We're rolling. Else? I mean, how, how long do you want to go? I mean, uh, that's a good time. I mean, we can talk duck numbers, bird numbers, Ooh. if you want to lag it, but I don't. If you we're we're going to start a, a riot somewhere. Oh, yeah, no. We'll wait, till, we'll wait to see next year's bird numbers. But let's talk about what do you guys see a lot of around here as, for, as for far like, as. duck species. Like, what, do you, what are you seeing primarily? <laughs> There's a lot of teal around here. A lot of teal. Good number of pintail. You can get on a good number of pintail. Um, I didn't realize they, were, they weren't so as – common as in the rest of the country as there are here i know in the, the state in general right it's like even back home where me and me and nate grew up it's yeah i mean they you can you can shoot some pintail here and there right but you know we're we're mainly what mallard mallards and, and teal and you know w- widgeon and gadwall but yeah you you come out west it's the the pintail numbers are extremely different than than other parts of the state we kind of have an interesting environment south of lubbock um there's a lot of a ponds, and I'm not for sure if they're like natural ponds. Or if, I mean, with Lubbock being flat, you got to get dirt to build stuff from somewhere. So there's just a lot of random holes in the ground. Um, dirt tanks. But yeah. the water is a lot of times brackish, and that attracts a lot of diving ducks. So we have the occasional redhead, canvas bag. I mean, it's really a good mix of birds. Um, I wouldn't say. Like there's a giant pop besides teal, there's not a giant population of one thing. Hmm. So I mean, you go out and you'll shoot just about anything. That's what's good about it, right? You can you can go out and you you never know what's gonna come in, right? You right. Can, you could scout three thousand teal on a tank and and you know four hundred pintail for you know example and come back and shoot nothing but widgeon and mallard, right? It's mm-hmm. that that's what's good about out here. It's good. Make it's always exciting, you know. Mm-hmm. Has that, has uh, how have things this year looked compared to other years that you guys been on campus? I think we're up, right? Yeah, a lot of water, can, yeah, which has honestly made it tough. Um, we have about three, maybe four public, uh, probably five public spots within an hour and a half, and those places usually hold water, and they did this year, but just the influx of of water available has made it hard to hunt public ground. Um, we had a lot of good rain this summer and this we did. fall. I think it was. I think we're up like a from like a twenty year uh, drought. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, it kind of broke it, but um, um, it, it's like looking good. Crane, we, crane are looking good. Geese are starting to trickle down. That's one thing that kind of hmm. hasn't been as great this year is, is geese. Um, they they were a little late getting down here, and the numbers aren't super crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, that could have anything to do from migration shift to you know breeding grounds i mean it is what it is i spend a lot of time with just other fowl and you know dove numbers and quail numbers are up like they haven't been for a long time and that's good to see because 
you know, they're doing good. Most other things are doing good. So, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. kind of wondering, like, I mean, I I'm not an expert on on dove numbers, but it seems like there's so many out here, and I'm I'm almost wondering if at some point there's gonna be like a like a limit increase or like. Like, you, you look around out here, and, I mean, it is just covered in dove all year. I mean. And I, I part of it's Eurasian. Right. But are you familiar with the Eurasian, like? A little bit. That's just mm-hmm. the barn bird. Yeah. Just, you know, it's like a rock pigeon, basically. Yep. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, 15 birds on a day is, I don't know what to think about it. Yeah. You know, it, Meat wise, there's not a whole lot there, but it's good eating. Well, meat um, meat wise, we need to be about 150 a day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, you can. Uh, you could kill them out here. You could kill 150 easy. We just need to take all these dough that we have out here in Lubbock and West Texas and push them. Yeah, <laughs> push push them back to where we grew up. There, there's <laughs> plenty to share with everybody. Yeah, they're they're getting a little thin back home. So, uh, <sighs> snow goose is is. So, like, when I moved up here, I mean, this has just been the trend with snow geese, just population increase, boom after boom after boom. Uh, when I moved up here, the snow geese usually stayed pretty north, Amarillo. I mean, you could you could get on them down here occasionally, but, I mean, now it's like a pretty constant hmm. um, pretty constant push of snow geese, um, which is, a nut, like, I mean, that's a whole other industry that's going to pop up here in the next probably – year year and a half is is snow goose hunts i mean they already did it but now with the birds kind of really moving this way um, i think it's going to be another big big thing uh, i think stuff's always changing you know we got you know there's i hear elk herds are moving down what you something what kind of deer is moving west yeah, as, what, as far as no it's like a coo deer or something coos deer yeah coos deer yeah that's that's uh you know that's New Mexico and Arizona and you know far far west Texas yeah. southwest Texas got them and yeah hmm. but I'm you know just even big game moves around even you know, birds deer. move around I mean, yeah mo- uh, yeah have that's y'all it. seen the stuff about the black bears you know uh uh-uh. out yeah. out here uh yeah oh, so I have uh San Antonio yep Austin uh San Saba there's a a lot of them El Paso which is is common that that's understandable uh, Amarillo. Yeah. Like near uh, Paladero. Yeah. I mean, the the population of, of black, Texas black bear is really, really booming. Well, um, good. The, Maybe we'll come wipe some pigs out for it. <laughs> shoot, I don't is know. Is there if a anything season on like. those? I don't, I don't know what the. I'm not familiar with that. I don't think you can that. shoot them. I, uh, for, for black bear? Yes, sir. Uh, as, far as, as far as the state of Texas goes, I don't know. I've. Maybe bear, like bear hunts kind of out of my realm. Maybe there's a unit like, like way like El Paso, like uh, drawn tags or something. Like I was that. gonna say bear bears got to be like a, a specific tag. Yeah. I mean, you're not gonna go out and shoot five bear like a, like you would <laughs> yeah. a white tail, right? I mean, I mean, you don't even have to have a, I mean, a, a permit or anything to, sh- or I mean, you may have to have a hunting license, but like the even the Texas elk, like yeah, it's not a it's not a game species, regular, uh-uh. yeah, which it it's weird because it's really not an exotic like it, it is a right. texas elk but it it hadn't gotten seen for you know right. ever and then it came back and people just kind of labeled it as an exotic that's like <laughs> fr- friends back home you know they there's ranches we go down and hunt down in, in south texas and you know south texas has has elk running around and it's the same way if whether it's 120 degrees down there you know in the middle of july or it's you know 20 degrees and ice falling out of the sky down there you know shoot an elk for shoot it with whatever bow rifle i mean another interesting thing is the axis deer yep like that as have you you from so i don't follow big game much uh, good eating too yeah they're, they're great eating but uh so axis deer um they'll feed on anything they're not like white tail or they're picky and uh they've escaped from a lot of big game ranches and now i mean they're pretty prevalent everywhere and they're kind of it used to be cool, like, oh, we have access to you on this property. Now it's, oh, we have access to you on this property, and we need to, like, get rid of them. Because yeah. yeah. white tails probably brings in more money than any oh, other, yeah. you know. Well, you know, like, even I'm familiar with some country a little bit east of here. And, uh, you know, you get off this cap rock, and it turns into just big canyons and caves. And, you know, the ground splits in random places. And you got Audad and 
different sheep that have escaped from high fences and mm -hmm. now they have flourishing populations that you know they're just out in open country and they're doing good because it's what they're used to just we have more endangered animals like from africa than <laughs> africa has period is that a yeah. is that a that, fact that's like a proven I don't yeah like we really are like a safari at this point we got to think. I mean, all all these safaris in the state, you know, and, and high fences, they're getting all these exotics, you know, and they're they're getting out right. Pigs are busting the fence. Like heck, for example, back beginning of this year, I guess I walked out of my front door and my, my home back home, and we had a peacock sitting in a tree, and our front yard fanned out. Like who who knew? Central Texas had wild peacock running around. It's so, probably the ones from my house. Yeah, that we yeah, kind of forgot yeah, about. Yeah, so I'm like, well, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't know if I wanted to shoot it or I didn't know what to do. Neighbors, man. <laughs> man, keep your keep your stuff contained. Well, that's, we kind of talked about that today and birds getting out of. Uh, uh, I almost just said actuaries. A a aviaries. aviaries. Yeah, with um, the, we were talking about the the was it the mandarins? Or yes. Yeah. Mandarin, yeah. Mandarin ducks. Has there ever? I don't. Has there ever been like a like a species that's got out and started? You know. I don't know. Making what? changes. Well, so. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, so we did, we did have a friend back home, and and Nate was, weren't, were you with him that morning? No, he just sent me pictures of so, it. So, so so yeah, we got. To, I'm sure we got the same pictures, and it was this off the wall, most bizarre looking duck slash goose slash wood duck slash <laughs> I don't know what it was. It was a mixture of kind of if it had wings on it, it was like everything put together into this duck. But it didn't look like a black Angus cow. No, it did not. It was actually a super beautiful duck, but I'm like. Like, I first texted him. I'm, like, joking with him. I'm, like, dude, that's endangered. And of course, <laughs> he starts flipping out. I he know. Said, really? I, was, I said, I think so. I said, that's, like, you know, that's, like, the second one ever killed in the state. I'm trying to find the picture of it, man. That thing was weird. I, I might have it saved. Um, shoot. So, it, it was either a, a mallard wood duck hybrid, which has got to be rare, or it was a farm, a souped-up feral farm yeah. duck. I'm, I'm thinking farm duck. Just because of the weird, I mean, like. I was just listening to a deal. So, like, that's its head. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and that's yeah. the whole duck. Oh, yeah. Dude, that's hey, a, you guys are showing me that. He didn't mount that, right? He said it was at the taxidermist. Oh, he did. Get, he did <laughs> okay. Because I, I was like, it's man, did, I was like, man did you eat it? Because, like, I'm sure that thing's, like, grain-fed. <laughs> oh, yeah. This <laughs> thing's and got he's like, no, it's at the taxidermist. And I was like, okay. I mean, a farm duck that probably came from like a farm auction or something. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like, so you're getting this off the wall bizarre animal, you know, mounted, and he they shot a stud sprig, and I'm like, well, <laughs> that was I guess, well. I guess he destroyed it a little bit too yeah, much. Yeah, it, it was pretty beat and, up, but yeah, that was a pretty funny. Nothing an extra feather won't fix. So yeah. I was listening to the deal about how how those pen birds are have getting out, and their you know genetics have kind of spread and. I guess it, I guess it was Meat Eater and Ducks Unlimited is doing the DNA yeah, thing now. So, man, what a great opportunity to plug this. <laughs> <laughs> That's wow. Why I'm here? <laughs> just, just throw me softballs here. Uh, well, yeah. So, I, I'm sure if, if you're following Ducks Unlimited, you've been able to see some of their promoting some of the some of the things they're promoting. Um, one of them being the, the duck DNA project that they're working on this year. This, it's the pilot season where the goal is to to really get hunters involved in the, the science. And right. then also yeah. on the science side, like figure out the genetics of these mallards that are, um, yeah. Is it mallard specific? Well, it's the, the mallard gene, like, I don't know what you would call oh, it. Oh, But like the, yes. the gene line or yes. whatever of yes. mallards. So you got mallards, you got... Mexican ducks, you got mild ducks, you got kind of black ducks in that mix. Right. Um, all of them have kind of, in a way, have, there's like these areas where there's hybrids of these right, like types a, of ducks. And if you were to look at a duck, you're like, you can't, it's, you can't tell whether or not it's 100% Mexican oh, duck or 100% right. mallard. So what they do is, and what this project does, is um, working with the... Uh, University of Texas El Paso with Phil Lovretsky. DU's partnering up with them and doing this duck DNA project where, yeah, um, hunters are able to apply to be a part of this program. And I, I, they, I don't know if it's still open right now, but um, 
if I think the you can still enroll, but I don't know if they're still sending them out. But um, definitely enroll this year because that way the information is there for potentially doing it like next season nice. and everything, and shows your support for that type of mm-hmm. program. So I highly encourage you to uh, apply. But what it is, yeah, a hunter will get like a packet, and then they get like a set of five vials, I think. And then what a hunter does is when they collect a a mallard um, or any type of that kind of set. <laughs> Um, you kind of click, clip off like a quarter inch of the tongue and then put it in the vial, do your, like, make sure seal it up, get up, do that five times with different ducks, um, send it to the lab. And then once those are ran through testing or like, yeah, been analyzed, you get like a, I think they're sending out like cool little certificates about that duck and like a oh, genetics cool. report, that's kind of like a, cool. like yeah. a, like an ancestry type deal on the duck on the where, duck. you know, the genetics of it. Ancestor.com for right. ducks, baby. <laughs> right. So, um, and that's kind of for the reason of that larger, like, um, I don't know if you've listened to the Meat Eater, Meat Eater podcast, uh, Dr. Philip Lavretsky was on that podcast uh, talking about kind of the things that are happening amongst the genetics of mallards and how originally, yeah, being from Europe, then coming over to the U.S., uh, being having game farm mallards and then now how those mallards have like those genetics were altered for the not the thrill not the just for sport they wanted to have a faster more like difficult bird, eater bird yeah to shoot um and those genetics were then carried over to kind of the u.s and then started mixing with the already existing wild mallards and how now those genetics are kind of moving through the gene pool um and he goes in depth in that podcast so it's super interesting um and now having that project with work with hunters contributing to it and just more data the better the samples the the bigger the sample size really the better uh, way you can analyze uh, what's going on so um how do uh like is there like a website um yes that you go to um, yeah it's it's, uh i think it's duckdna.com so, yeah, I'll or, fact check. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think it's dot org. I think it's dot com. <laughs> it's going back to like the uh, like the the European mallards. I mean, I'm duck DNA duck. Fairly new to waterfowl hunting. What's like the difference between like a, a straight European mallard and a and like a game farm mallard? Well, so the those are the the same. Oh, okay, yeah, so like yeah, so the so. It'd be wild and uh, game farm. So originally, like, you have the original strand. So this is my comprehension. Interpretation. Interpretation yeah. of this study and, like, how I... Be it consumed. factually correct yes. or not. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, like, you have your original strand of DNA. This is how I see it. I'm not a geneticist yep. or whatever <laughs> professor. <laughs> so, but then... Texas Tech University. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying for the sake for the <laughs> You're listeners. impressing us, man. I'm, yeah. in, I'm in the major. You, and you're like, you got your base, right. essentially. And so over in Europe, uh, hunters in that during that time, they wanted a more flightier, like a, a more Wild diffi- flying. Uh, they wanted yeah. a more difficult bird to shoot because these that base strand was kind of kind of just lame. They wanted something more difficult. They wanted a faster duck, a more faster maneuvering duck. And so... To do that, it's like they started. It's not. It's, I don't know if it's like Jurassic Park stuff where they're they're, they're going in and moving different pieces of the DNA exactly. Right. But they got. They were able to find a process. Selective or breeding. Yeah, they were find, They were able to find a process yeah. to then get to a, a more sportier duck. Um, and so that's a different strand of DNA, and that's what you're getting now. And and those are those game farm ducks. Um, and it's interesting because like their migration. What? Yeah the lab is finding is like the other their migration patterns are different and a lot they talk about i think it's yeah a lot shorter their ha- durations their hatch rates are lower hatch rates are lower the success success rates are and, and that things are lower so it's has some you know like, yeah negative um character not characters but yeah just negative things um that are happening but it's Go listen to that podcast, please. Yes. He's the expert. <laughs> it is meat eater, correct? Yeah, they they did a podcast, and then he's been on um, the the um, Ducks Unlimited podcast yeah. as well. I think a couple times, or mm-hmm. if not more. So, but yeah, I think that's something that a lot of you're going to start hearing more about is because I don't like. It seems like this last year, it's like 
you really started hearing more about duck genetics. <laughs> right. Um, and that even being a possibility to, to learn and do research. And so I feel um, like that's something that really has, I mean, it, it probably has been like a kind of a low key thing for the last couple of years. And then now it's really starting to, you know, pick up. It's starting to surface on, on like just the public level where right. that, that research probably has been maybe going on. Yeah. But it's now it's like kind of finally surfaced where I think we're with most, most things that, you know, stuff just gets cheaper to do and right. You get to expand and yeah, do more with it once it's yeah the the research tour that we do like even on like we've only done five trips of that and hearing from professors students um, some of the like the peers that I was able to like interact with on those trips it's like these last few years of just the technological advances in like and it, this is just like just for waterfowl right. <laughs> yeah. of things that they've been able to learn like just with like the uh, GPS backpacks and transmitters like that's using um, like cell towers to transmit data and you're getting real time data of where exactly that duck's at at a certain point elevation speed like all all these types of things um, and you you can set different time blocks of like when you want or how often you want one of those well, that, like like talking about like those GPS and, and net callers and stuff and uh, you know geese and, and and transmitters on ducks too it's it's like that, that friend of mine up in Illinois that shot that Canadian with, with the uh, mm-hmm. net collar on it and GPS tracker. It's And we, we got the opportunity to, to listen to him have the conversation with the, with the biologists up there. And, you know, it's their, their research and the, the technology advance, advancements that are behind all of that are actually pretty pretty impressive, right, to see that, you know, hey, this bird's traveling, you know, from, you know, Manitoba, Canada down the – you know, Mexico City or wh- wherever they're traveling to, right? And to be able to see that and actually put that to a study and actually understand what what and why the birds are doing that, to mm-hmm. me, is, is pretty neat. And that ho- hopefully that'll that's going to help. You know, not necessarily the population, but the understanding of of how they in, how they act out. You know, on their own, right? Yeah. Instead of just seeing them firsthand in, in a blind. Did you say it had a three G collar on it? Yeah, it was it was three G. It was it was old school. <laughs> I think now they're four G and I don't I don't know if they're I don't know if they've gone to five G yet unless unless it's on new 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 collars. But yeah. yeah, that was that was a pretty good trophy shoot up there the That's for him cool. to knock that down. Heck yeah. Mm-hmm. I feel like those numbers are like really vital for getting people to like understand like migration of ducks. Like oh, yeah. you can say like, okay, this duck travels, you know, thousands of miles and like you know, big deal. Like that number really doesn't like sound super crazy. And then you look on a map, and it went from Canada to Mexico, yeah. and you know, yeah, four or five months. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. that. That's like this goes too. It's like so. The, the kind of a short story behind that is, and I may, from my understanding, this this was an urban bird or in an urban area, right? And it wasn't really with a mass migration of birds. And where he shot it was, you know, up up there on the Mississippi and Illinois, and it was. It kind of took a change. That was like its own rogue bird, I believe, and then it kind of ming- you know intermingled itself into another group of Canadian geese, and that that's a big part. It's like why why did that goose leave its safe haven up there wherever it was at to join another another group of geese and, and take the Great Migration when it's been been in one location for so long, right? So it's not, trying to understand that that aspect of it, I think too, is is pretty neat just in itself. I think it's cool to be able to, you know, you're you're essentially being able to zoom out on what they're doing on like a macro, or you know, before you don't have any of that stuff. You just birds come this time of year and they go that time of year, and mm-hmm. wow, that's neat. And now we get to, you know, zoom out and see them coming from Manitoba and all the way down to Mexico and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you would, you would get those. So like the banding system, like just bands, right. like you would right. you'd have point A to point B, like that's you got right. two points a day right. Right. with those. But now it's like you got the whole path of like seeing mm-hmm. stop over sides, how how long they're yeah. going to be stop over sides, what kind of habitat they're actually stopping over in, what kind of um, like yeah habitat, but then also like uh, food sources are in those areas, general areas. What they order from Whataburger. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Those are the questions we need to answer. Yeah. That's why they actually <laughs> migrate is so they get to water. Well, they can come down through Texas <laughs> hey, and yeah, get to right. Waterburger. Because let me tell you something: you can go to a Waterburger in another state. It's it's not the same as a Texas Waterburger. I you caught a lot. I yeah. caught a lot of slack when some Chicago company bought Waterburger. I'm not gonna lie. I, I it it hurt me. You know. Oh, I I quit supporting for a minute, but I couldn't hold off too long. 
I felt I felt lied to and betrayed. You know what? I I think I always knew this podcast would end on talk about Whataburger. <laughs> I, I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> well, it's Before hard. we end it, uh, it's hard to stay away from. I just want to say thank you to Jonathan Underwood mm-hmm. with Caprock Waterfowl yeah. for, yes. for taking us out this weekend. Um, it, it's been a hoot. I mean, it, we've seen a lot of birds. It's been a good time. We still got tomorrow to go too, so yeah. I'm, I'm excited yeah. to see what happens. Get on them, yeah. Real class act out here. Just so <laughs> don't yeah. don't get skunked, right? Yeah. One, yeah. one bird. Mm-hmm. No, it's going to be. It's been a fun weekend. Yeah, I can't thank Jonathan enough for. Um, Letting us hang out with him yeah. and hunt with him this weekend. Been able to, like this just this morning, like what we were yeah. saying earlier, learned a ton just oh, sitting yeah. there yeah. chatting with him. Yep. And we, yeah, we didn't, you know, we didn't come close to limit, but just to be out there, I mean, it was a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing yeah, the birds and getting to talk with him, just each if, other. If yeah. anything, sit sit back and learn something, right? It's it's like for all you new people that are, that are wanting to get in the waterfowl, right? It's, and if you don't like, if you don't have the connections, right? And, you know, you, you know, you may have one or two friends or, or a guide you take, right? If if you take anything away from that, just, just sit back and watch because you, you'll be surprised how much you can learn just just sitting back and watch. Like my trip to Illinois, for example, it was – that's a totally different style of hunting. And just even though we, we didn't kill the birds like we were hoping, but having the opportunity to see how they hunt and and take their skill set and intermingle it to to our, our way of waterfowl hunting, it's – it's pretty amazing on how how you can grow in in your knowledge and in the way you hunt, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, thank you, Jonathan, with Caprock, Caprock Outfitters. Also, want to thank Fowler Hide Supply, Cameron and Drew, for their hospitality here, letting us yeah. hang out in their in the HQ here. Um, and then also Nathan, you are an employee, so <laughs> that is me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, thank thank you to to both of them uh, yeah. for everything help helping out this weekend on on a last minute trip again yes <laughs> I, th- I think we're getting known for that campus I, that, that's is. how it goes <laughs> uh, but and then also we get we're gonna have a new person in the blind tomorrow we get to who did who did he, he had think, uh, uh I believe it's silencers silencer central reps gonna be in there so now we get we'll be able to talk some silencers tomorrow that'll morning um so that'll be that'll be fun um uh, uh what else no the Can't. real question is Tech winning right now, or did they win? Oh, oh no, they yes. won. They okay. did. It's because yeah. of the tortilla. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Tortilla. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. So we, we got that in the podcast. That, that's well. right. Yep. That was most important. So. All right. Well, can't. Yeah. Thank you guys for letting me come out here. Yeah. Thank um, you. Thanks for coming out. Hanging out for the weekend. Last minute, like I said. <laughs> Change of plans. But I think it, it all worked out. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We've had a, we've had a hoot. Yeah. So. All righty. Well, um, again. Merry Christmas, everyone. I uh, hope you can spend lots of time with friends and family uh, during this holiday break, during your semester break. Um, relax while you can. Get out in the field while you can if you got uh, still some hunting to do. But uh, I think that's going to do it here from Texas Tech in Lubbock, Texas. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you all in the next one. Rackham Tech? Yep, Rackham Tech. That's right. <laughs>